Welcome back, everybody. This is Derek DDP Kirby. It's been so long since I've done this, I almost hesitated to go, <laughs> do I use DDP still or not? I haven't used it in a while. The world call you has Big forgotten Daddy. the name. Let's call but, you uh, Big Daddy. Yeah. Derek Daddy Kirby. There you go. This is but, the uh, first time face to face since you've had your child, so. Uh, yeah, she's five months old today. Yeah, yeah. actually. It's been, uh, you know, pretty crazy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah just and thinking oh, all sorts of other stuff that went down since we last seen each other and that's probably why yeah there's there's been a lot going on for sure um i mm -hmm. i don't think i've actually appeared on the channel in two months like literally the night the season ended for the mavericks i was oh, on gosh. the channel doing post game and I, i've been active in like the community tab and stuff like talking a little bit with post but haven't really actually appeared until now so i'm trying to remember like do I, what do I do here? Do I sit here? Am I, am I close enough to the mic? Like I don't, mm -hmm. it's all rust at this point, but that's all right. Cause uh, you've actually appeared on the channel just recently. Uh, thank Boom. you again for the work you did on that. The Mavericks draft preview with Mavs draft. Very mm -hmm. fitting guest. <laughs> <laughs> Funny story about that. So I just add, I just messaged him on Twitter. I was like, Hey man, you want to jump on a podcast, talk Mavs draft with me. And I got, I got him for an, like an hour. Like our, the podcast was legitimately an hour and like 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. And I had no idea the kind of, uh, I guess, I don't want to say the kind of pull that he has. Like he's been on The Fan. He's been on so many other Mavericks podcasts. Nice. Uh, just perhaps. I had no idea how big he was. I thought he was, I thought he was literally, uh, you know, some dude who just knew who he was talking about, what he was talking about on Twitter. So I was like, Hey man, let me get you on a podcast. I thought it was just like having uh, Max on the podcast, but apparently he's well. I thought it was one of us, and he was actually yeah, way above was, our pay grade. <laughs> yeah, so he's like well respected in Mass Twitter. A bunch of people shout him out. I I probably listened to like three or four different uh, three or four different podcasts pertaining to Mavs drafting, and they mm -hmm. all shout him out. They've all shout him out. So it was Fair awesome. Enough. All it was awesome getting a time just uh, shooting the breeze with him talking mass draft and we actually got a lot done and talked about you know we actually talked about someone that we actually got on the team so yeah it was uh it was a great it was a great uh podcast for sure i was happy to get that posted before the draft and everything kind of get some of the engagement going on the channel again right before the draft so speaking of the draft we actually have a number of things to talk about yeah. history seems to kind of have shifted here a little bit the mavericks They've always been, or I say always, recent years have been more interested in kind of bits as far as the, hey, we're not drafting in like the top 10, so we're going to take this random guy from India or something who's like seven foot eight and uh, can barely walk, let alone run up and down a basketball court. But hey, we'll sell Mavs jerseys in India, that sort of yep. thing. And uh, mm -hmm. I felt like this was a really, really well thought out plan and it kind of shows where they're headed. Uh, what, let me let me know what you thought of that. Well, I, I do agree with you. That was some of the things I was worried about is how are they how are they going to come into this draft? What are their mindset? Are they just going to be laissez faire with the picks? Um, are they just going to go for the international prospect? Because that's just what we do apparently. But I'm actually really pleased with what they came out with. Um, and you know, I thought one of the things, especially I was talking with Richard with, is um, you know, as fans, we've kind of taken on the identity with uh, drafting um, as the same as how the front office is. So the fans were kind of really big on it. Any name that came out, there was like, yeah, trade 18 and 31 for this. Where it's like, no, we can we can actually do something with this. So I think right before the draft, it was like, hey, the Mavericks were talking about trading 18 for uh, Gallinari. Like, I mean, cool, he's a name. I mean, he's good. I'm not saying that he's not good. But, you know, 18 and, um, you know, whatever we can get with 18 plus, you know, another free agent or something that could yeah. possibly happen, can be in summation better than just having Gallo on the team. So I was excited that they actually were use their, uh, I guess their, their assets uh, pretty smartly in my, in my, in my in how I thought about it. And I'm actually really pretty pleased on how draft night ended up for the maps. Yeah, for sure. I mean, like, like you said with Gallinari, he is a good player. But he's 32 years old, and he's had a history of injuries. And while he was great last year in the regular season, 
he wasn't so good for the for the Thunder in their seven game loss to the Rockets in the first round. And you know, as much as people want to say like, oh, well, if you pair him with Luca, you can get something more out of him that maybe others haven't gotten. Well, he had Chris Paul, who just had a, a little bit of a career rejuvenation in Oklahoma City mm-hmm. for one year. Now he's in Phoenix. Um, and we'll, you know, probably be able to keep riding that rejuvenation for a little bit now that he's not playing with James Harden. Mm-hmm. But uh, that that's just kind of like, you could do better, I think, with that. Like Gallinari, he's a good player, but he doesn't really fit our window. He doesn't address what was key needs mm-hmm. for us. Like the the playoff run showed like, we had a historically efficient offense and mm-hmm. it amounted to a seven seed and a first round exit. Like mm-hmm. we had to make adjustments on the defense. It's not a matter of saying like, Oh, we'll just try to outscore the, every team. You're not going to be able to get away with that forever. And I think they kind of realized that. And what I like is that they clearly came into this with a plan in mind. And mm-hmm. even if they didn't make a quote splashy move necessarily, they made a lot of savvy moves, I thought, that really showed, like, full commitment to this kind of philosophical shift. And at 18, they end up keeping the pick. They get Josh Green. Uh, I'm very, very intrigued by this pick. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think. Like, I know that you, you were high even on Desmond Bain there. Um, but with Green, they kind of fill the role as well with the 3 and D guy. And you get someone who – I think he can bring a lot to it, but he doesn't have to be an immediate day one guy for you because of what you made on uh, later on with a trade, which we'll get into in a minute. But tell me your thoughts uh, on Green. Yeah, so if you actually go back to the to the draft uh, podcast I did with uh, Matt's draft, Mr. Stamen, he actually had uh, Josh Green as his number one prospect for the Mavs. Hmm. Um, so that you know, that's actually really good. It fits everything that the Mavericks really needed. Yeah, we had Sadiq Bay available and Desmond Bain available for 18. And I was one of the guys that – two of the guys that I really wanted. In fact, I was actually going to do a uh, uh, five picks that I will want for the 18th and 31, uh, kind of a wish list type deal. And Josh Green was four. Uh, so he was on the list. Um, so we got him. And what he brings, he definitely brings – defense uh he brings the ability to shoot he brings a high motor high character guy of course he has his international vibes as well but still that's not really that much of a problem it's he does fit the mold athletic tall i think he said he had a six we said he had a 610 wingspan so he's a little long so um, that's something that the mavericks really needed uh came away with another guy another body that can help uh you know contain some of these offensive threats that we have to go through being in the West, being a James Harden, being a LeBron James, uh, kind of cats like that, that we have to go through on a, on a nightly basis. Devin, Devin Booker now, now, you know, the, the, the Suns are now officially a threat um, for the, for the playoffs this year. So this is the kind of guys that we need to throw bodies at. And we were at times, you know, throwing Seth Curry, uh, depending on, what the other team is doing on offense, what screens they're running, what sets they're running. We end up, we, <laughs> there are times we ended up with Seth Curry on a Kawhi Leonard or something like that. Yeah. So now, yeah, so now with, uh, with the moves that the Mavs made, especially with Josh Green, we have other guys who are athletic who can at least stay in front and, and be more, uh, more of a presence on, on the defensive end to help us on that end. Yeah, for sure. And, yeah, it's a good it's a good value pick there. Um, I didn't realize Mav Jeff had him that high. That Richard had him quite yeah. that high for like the for the Mavericks prospects there. No, honestly, honestly, he said it, and I thought he misspoke. Yeah, but but then he he was on another podcast, and then he said it again. I was like, oh, he really thinks yeah, Josh is number one. I was like, okay, I was like, all right. I mean, I have him. I'm, there was a dude I was looking forward to, um, and then. When when they drafted me, he's like, that's the guy I wanted and stuff. I'm like, I mean, this dude was in every Mavericks podcast talk, talking draft, and that's the guy he wanted. So I'm like, it kind of helped me out a little bit. So, I mean, shout out to Rich. And, yeah. and def- looking into what Josh can bring, I mean, hey, you want, I mean, absolutely, why not? Um, in hindsight, I mean, he does bring a higher motor than a Sadiq Bay on the defensive end. Uh, Sadiq Bay can be a little top-heavy. So I think when it 
comes to change of direction. So if a, if a player did like a little step back, herky jerk type movement, Sadiq Bay would kind of be caught uh, on his back foot and not mm-hmm. be able to reach as as a Josh Green. So I, I definitely love to pick. Looking back, I was high on it. And then when I did a little bit more research and trying to hype myself up more about it, I ended up hyping myself up more about it. So I am really pleased about the pick. Yeah, and he should definitely bring as well the physical presence uh, with his Aussie football background and everything. So <laughs> obviously that was that was something that they made sure to mention in there. They they yeah. kind of love when they can lean on things like that. You heard that with like Stephen Adams and stuff too. Like, oh yes, New, you know, like New Zealand there and the, the physicality and everything of a rugby style player. Like, yeah, yeah, it, it's yeah. it's nice for sure. I uh, mean, we definitely definitely needed a, a dude like that on the team we have too many nice guys and small guys right. and, yeah yeah so then pick 31 rolls around it looks like we might have uh mm-hmm. the guy you and i i think were were highest on granted uh i i freely admit i i wasn't as in the loop for much of the run-up to the draft i basically caught myself up to speed for within reason basically of like who the mavericks could possibly have within the first two picks they had, you know, basically one full round plus one pick. Um, and our guy, Desmond Bain, looked like he was going to be there, yeah. fell think, all the way to one pick away. And yeah. I was like, oh, Boston doesn't even need a big. It, it's it's done. We got him. And then suddenly <laughs> you hear from Wojbaum, uh, you get a freaking Memphis trade up. And I was like, those sons. Like, I didn't even need the name. I was like, those sons of bitches. <laughs> Exactly. All of Matt's Twitter was behind uh, Desmond Bain. And yeah. Everyone, the, the Bain train was getting started. Everyone was hyped up. We're all counting down. All these players again. Uh, all these players are drafted. And I was like, yes. Especially when like international players were leaving. I was like, thank God, get these distractions out the way. <laughs> so when, when Balmero went, I was like, thank God, because people were talking about that's probably who the Mavs wanted at 18. I was like, hell no, we don't need. Don't need that. We don't stop. Stop it. Pokushevsky left. I was like, thank God. Get all these distractions out the way. Right. So on what we needed. So, yeah, he was falling. He was falling. And then uh, 30 came. And I like, one more pick. And that, was, that was it. And then. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's interesting. <laughs> I read something from Tim Cato today. He says the Mavericks were never actually looking at Bain at 31. Oh, really? He, yeah. His thing was saying, um, that they were basically locked in on the guy they ended up taking, Tyrell Tyler, uh, Terry, excuse me. Terry, yeah. Um, I was like, okay, make sure I get the tie, like, in the first name. Like, say that right. And then once I started thinking T-Y, T-Y, it threw me off. <laughs> but, uh, yes, Tyrell Terry is uh, yeah. who they get at 31 out of Stanford. And, man, it sounds like they might have gotten one of, like, if not the best marksman, like, one of the very best marksmen you could get in this draft – and to get him at 31 is pretty incredible. And then when you see the move that followed it moments later, it made even more sense to me. Like yeah. you're able to add a guy whose off ball movement is really good. You got a guy who has a very quick release and actually looked like he was pretty decent finishing around the rim from what I saw mm-hmm. in some of uh, his highlight packages. Uh, and he's not, he's going to have some, you know, he's not a defensive guy. Like obviously the Mavericks went heavy on defense with this draft and the trade, but I think it's a very good pickup and it's a guy that will fill in that role immediately for the move that then followed it. Uh, let me know what, what were your thoughts on the Terry pick as it came in? So initially, initially I was kind of confused about what, why we would go for a guy like that. Um, Cause I, I talked about, I brought him up when we did the podcast with Richard and I was like, we don't need any more guards cause we, we have all the guards. Mm-hmm. Uh, a log jam of guards so when we, when we picked him up i was like i mean he can shoot cool whatever and then when the news came i was like okay so it maybe it just kind of makes sense uh and then it ended up being seth curry that had to go and i was like f uh yeah but it, and <laughs> it makes all the sense in the world uh but it did hurt because i was such a big steph curry guy um, yeah. seth, um but it does make sense. Hey, I mean, at, when all said and done, it was a great move. People were describing it as the steal of the draft, or one of the one of the steals of the draft. Mm-hmm. Um, people had him as a lottery type guy. He was rising up. I think um, he was listed as six one when he was playing in Stanford. But throughout the, I guess, the hiatus, 
they said he grew two inches and he put on about 10, 15 pounds of uh, muscle. Um, so, I mean, 6'3", 180 probably. Yeah. I mean, still small type guy, but I, I like what he can bring. Yes, he's a really good shooter. I like the kind of movement. His, his, his style of movement reminds me a, a lot of, uh, of uh, Trey, Trey um, what's his name? Trey, not Trey Bird. You have the other Trey. Ice Young? Trey. Trey Young. Yeah. Yeah. Um, not saying that he, they play the same style. I'm just saying the type of I was like, of are we talking Mavs great Trey Burke here? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, he, he reminds me a little bit of that. Um, but better defensively than a Trey Young, even though that's not saying much. That's probably not. That's a low saying, bar. I, I can step over that bar. <laughs> that's not saying anything at all. But, no, he, he is he, – he's a more savvy on the defensive end. Um, he can jump, steal, uh, jump passing lanes and stuff like that. So, um, and he's a lot more athletic than people might think. There's a, there are some uh, uh, highlights of him getting some steals and actually throwing it down. Uh, hmm. So, pretty cool. He sounds like he sounds like a, a cool guy, good down to earth guy, hard worker. Um, he was a straight A student in, in high school and and ended up going to Stanford, which we all know Stanford is not an easy school to get into, even though if you're an athlete. And he managed to get a 3.5 uh, 3. GPA. What does that mean? That means he's a hard worker. So now focus all that hard work into, hey, just basketball and getting better at basketball. Because mm-hmm. the better at basketball, the more successful, the more income you get. So he's going to start using all that energy and focus into just basketball, being like that. There's no telling what he can bring and what he can, what he can be. And a lot of draft scouts had his potential being really high, being one of the top top 10 people in terms of potential in terms of ceiling. Yeah. Especially with the way the, the modern NBA game has taken shape. It seems like his exactly. style. If a, guy like Trey, much... if a guy like Trey Young can come in and freaking put the, put the uh, NBA on fire the way he did in his rookie year, I'm not saying Tyrell Terry's going to be a Trey Young by any means. I'm saying if we can get a percentage of that, that's, that's sure. not bad at all. We're talking yeah. about a guy coming in off our bench. And probably playing what fifty minutes the, his first year. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'd say that's fair. I'm super excited about it after doing some research. Oh my gosh, yeah, that's that's big time. That's yeah, big for time. sure. Now, obviously, with the move, so and you almost have to pair <laughs> these two together: the the uh, pick of Terry and then the trade yeah. that you referenced. Uh, so Seth Curry, who's number two all time with at least a, a thousand career attempts from three. Uh, second highest percentage all time, only behind Steve Kerr. He's like 44 point, I think like 3%. Kerr was like 45, four or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, incredible shooter percentage wise and everything like that. You and I have both always been very high on Seth Curry and loved having him on this team. We loved when he was here mm-hmm. the first time around back when the Mavericks were Yogi Ferrell and Harrison Barnes. And uh, <laughs> we lamented yeah, his true. departure literally bitterly lamented his departure for like weeks whenever we would come on the show talking about like what the Mavericks need. We're like, what they need is a player like Seth Curry. (laughs) Like just brutal. I think I I let out an audible yell when we signed him back last year. Like I was like legitimately like, yeah. Like, yeah. So his, his return was very much appreciated. And, you know, he had a rough stretch there for a little bit. And right before the initial uh, shutdown occurred, he was like insanely dialed in for like two and a half months or something where he was shooting like 50% or above 50%. I mean, he was just scorching hot. I don't think he ever completely found that rhythm again in the bubble. Like if you recall, like in the first bubble game we had without Luca and KP, we were like, we're like, Oh, this is a good game. Cause you know, the two Mavericks in a bit of a rut right now are Hardaway and Curry. And now they're going to have to get every shot basically. So he had moments here and there, but he never quite found that scorching temperature again. The thing, the thing about this deal to me, because you have some fans here for, for the Mavericks, whether they're newer fans or whatever, they look at this and you have the perception out there from some people like, oh, you're, you're getting rid of Luca's shooters. Like, <laughs> gone after his rookie contract's up. Like, Luca's done. That's it. He's, he's not going to stay around with losers. Like, Oh, okay. Please be patient and understand like new talent is coming through every year. 
and like actually look at the big mm -hmm. picture of what they're doing here. Like we talked about earlier, you can't get over the hump just trying to outscore everyone. Like if you're the Warriors from a few years ago, granted they were also a very good defense. I'm just saying like if you're like an offense that crazy good and with superstars of that nature, yeah, sure, you can probably get away with it if you wanted to, if you wanted the excuse not to have to play defense. But the Mavericks, as constructed, were 18th in defense last year. They were the hot, they had the best record of teams rated that low um, in the defensive average and everything. So, like, they were 18th, and they were the only team uh, in the bottom half of the league, as far as defense is concerned, I believe, that was over 500 as far as their record. So, that says a lot about how this team was built. And we can talk about, like, you know, hey, they, they had health issues with Luca and KP. They both missed 10 games here and there, and that was a factor. And then you had the disruption of the season being put on pause. Yeah, okay, fair. But the end result was still the same. This was a team that could not close in the stretch. A big part of that came down to defense. Uh, we're talking about the clutch specifically. A big part of that came down to defense, but it also was just yep. executing the offense. That you have to trust will work itself out but you do want to give yourself some, you know, decent weapons in that regard. So Dallas goes all in on this philosophy of we're going to go and we're just going to go get a bunch of athletic perimeter defenders. We're going to basically give Luca that which he most needs guys that are good to like decent to good level shooters who he can elevate their game as shooters, just giving them like amazing looks and, you know, they'll have a little bit of a career bump, kind of like Hardaway did working with Luca this past year. And on the defensive side, they'll just be absolute, like, nightmares to deal with for opposing teams. That, to them, is more valuable than Curry. As much as we love Curry, like, it's not even a question. Curry's 30, 31, yeah. I think, at this point. Oh, uh, yeah. So even in that regard, you got younger. He's going to be 30. Yeah. yeah, so you got younger and you have, um, you know, cheaper contracts in that regard, even though Curry had a great deal, $8 million a year is crazy good value for him. And you picked up pick 36, which you then got uh, Bay with that, Tyler Bay. And so I, I forget who it was that said it. It might have been uh, Bibbs on Mavs Twitter, basically saying the Mavericks went out and essentially got themselves three Dorian Finney-Smiths, all with higher ceilings than Dorian Finney-Smith. <laughs> Like this is, this is a really, <laughs> yeah. this is a really savvy, I think, uh, strategy here by the Mavericks in that regard. Like they have three now very good high ceiling perimeter defenders, guys who are athletes and can slash a little bit to the rim. And then they went out and got one of the best shooters you could have got. Uh, I, and I obviously Josh Richardson in the trade from, um, from Philadelphia he, he wasn't great shooting last year, but it, I think that wasn't a great situation for him in Philadelphia, just regarding like the floor spacing and all that, Ben Simmons and everything. The, the 76ers kind of fell apart in that regard, but he was much better in Miami prior to that, yep. including from three. Yep, totally so. And I definitely agree with everything that you said in terms of uh, just the overall makeup of the team and stuff like that and overall – uh, haul that we had and what we needed to do. Um, you know, we can, like I always joke around, hey, this Mavericks team that we had last year, they can put up 150 points a game, but, you know, we're always hovering around giving up 151 and yeah. stuff like that. So um, if, we can, if we can give up a little bit of offense and get a little bit of defense back, that would definitely help us. Uh, if, we would have done, if we would have probably had this squad that we had as constructed going into – um, that Clippers series, we probably would have done a lot better uh, because, like I said, people were joking. I mean, we literally had times when Seth Curry was guarding the fly. We literally had times when yeah. we had some some uh, negative defender on on um, Paul George and you know, asking Maxi to guard wings all series. Exactly, it, it, he's chasing around. He's chasing around uh, Kawhi and stuff like that. And we we don't want Luca to have to even have you know have the burden of being switched on to some of these big guys and sometimes it'll, it'll do that. I mean, you can, you can definitely hunt for that on, on in the playoffs, but when you have a guy like Tyler Bay, Josh Green, uh, Dorian Finney Smith uh, and Maxi Kleba as well, we have more bodies that can, you know, we can throw at people. If we're talking about, um, if we're matching up with 
the Houston Rockets and stuff like that. It was like who, as we had last year, who do we have? Like what bodies that we have to, to continue to throw? Dorian Finney Smith got in foul trouble. Who's who's the backup? Right. Uh, exactly. So we'll be we'll be s out of luck. And of course, I mean, we had um, Michael Kid Gilchrist, but he played very spot minutes. You know mm-hmm. how um, how Richard described Tyler Bay, the, the guy that we got from at the for the thirty sixth pick. He described Tyler Bay as a Michael Kid Gilchrist uh, type player, but back in the days when he was with the Charlotte Bobcats uh, and mm-hmm. when he was actually uh, productive as a player. So I Shots mean, fired. it's. <laughs> 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 we're talking about the dude who was back in i forgot i, I forgot that drafting one but it was anthony davis one and Michael yeah. Kujo, two. but uh i mean we're talking about dude compared to a former number two pick but tyler bay definitely he's a long dude he's six seven long arms super athletic um his offense is still developing but it it looks to have something there he shot about 41 percent from the three last year but he only shot one attempt a game so, yeah, that, that was the thing I saw in him. He, that was, the percentage was good. The attempts was way low. But the thing is, his, his mechanics with the shot aren't bad. It's not like we're dealing with a Michael Kidd Gilchris who literally shot with his elbow on the other side of his face. <laughs> I can't even, like, make my arms do that. I don't understand. It hurts to do that. Like, I don't know how he, he ended up shooting like that. It's probably, that's probably, like, the worst mechanic of a shot I've ever seen in my life. Even worse than... Uh, Kevin Martin push. and and Sean Murray. Like, yeah. Cool. Like, how does one do that? Maybe. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't understand. How, I. Yeah. So that de- definitely it, it helps, and there's still moves to make. We still have our nine point something million dollars middle uh, mid level exception that we can rock into uh, free free agency in here in the next couple of days and round out the rest of this um, round out the rest of this uh, roster. And we still we don't know what's going to happen with the long. We don't know what's going to happen with Justin Jackson. If they're able to find, if they're able to find a way to get those, uh, get those guys in another situation, I mean, that would be stellar. That would be a great move. If if, if Dora if Dora Mori could find a way to get rid of that uh, Al Horford contract in in uh, the Seventy Sixers, I I mean, I'm not saying that it's that level of bad, but right. That's still, yeah, I, I, we could find some players. Yeah, I mean, there, there's. There's a lot that they can still do. Like, they don't have a lot of money, obviously, open in free agency. Like, they have, uh, what, the mid-level exception that they can either use all on one guy or split up between two. But they can make trades of some kind. Like, the Gallinari one that was being talked about was a sign-in trade that was being discussed. Um, I, I don't know what they'll end up doing on that. It, it's It's tempting to say, like, oh, well, wouldn't you want them to – still go after one of those kind of second tier guys where you're still making a bit of a splash. Like, do you want to have to bank on, cause Tim Hardaway Jr. Has opted into his contract officially now and mm-hmm. Willie Colley Stein, even though there were reports that he was opting in, ended up opting out. Although that could just be so he can get a little bit better of a deal to stay with Dallas mm-hmm. instead of like 2.3, getting like 2.5 million or something like that. So there's different things going on there that kind of also keep the cap a little bit in flux. I think if you if you are able to retain him, then your center depth isn't in as bad of like your front court depth isn't as bad as I otherwise would have considered it. Cause I'm very cautious in counting Dwight Powell right now. Any guy coming off an Achilles in general, I'm cautious like to to think how good they're gonna be because Wes Matthews was so much better before he popped his Achilles right before coming to Dallas. And so you just never know, like, yeah. how much is it going to impact him? And Dwight Powell was literally the alley-oop guy for us. So mm-hmm. it, it's – I wouldn't uh, mind it's a, having Willie. Do what? I said I wouldn't mind having Willie Colley Stein back when you use some portion. Oh, of no, that. no. I have no problem at all having Colley Stein back. My, my point was just, like, there's no. still a lot – that they can do if they go the route of a trade, but now we're trying to identify like what they want. Cause like a buddy healed, for instance, doesn't really make as much sense now having just picked up because mm-hmm. buddy's so early into his contract. Uh, he just got it last year was his first year on the contract, I believe. And it was, uh, I think a f- yeah. four for 94 or something like that. It was, it was something along oh, those yeah. lines. And yeah. Uh, yeah. So that contract paying him that when now you have, 
Terry doesn't necessarily make as much sense. Not again, not that you want to throw Terry out there for like starter minutes or anything necessarily, but there's just a couple things like that that make me wonder if they are still looking for some kind of big splash. I think they'll work smartly with what they do, but I don't know that they're going to, unless like the perfect storm forms and they can get like someone they really, really want. And I, I don't think they really, really want buddy. I think they just were intrigued by the possibility so like there's there's stuff like that where I don't know what they're going to end up doing, but by no means is is it over. And you know even in looking at the the Mavericks team, like the people who were upset about the Curry deal, they were mad that like well, why didn't you send Justin Jackson and DeLon Wright instead? Like, do you think they have trade value right now? Yeah. Like, do you think that they're more valuable to them, especially to Doc Rivers? who basically brings in not only one of the all-time percentage-wise marksmen in NBA history, but his son-in-law. Like, is DeLon Wright, mm-hmm. Justin Jackson, that combination going to be more appealing to them? No, like, it's and, not going to work. And on top, top of that, who's the president of basketball operations is Daryl Moore, who's, yeah. like, the captain of the basketball. You're like, he's the, he's the captain of the, you know, threes and layups type basketball. And he's like, well, all right, guys that can make layups. Well, let me get guys that can make threes. Who was Justin Jackson shooting? Didn't he shoot like 29% from his three-point last year? He fell quite so, far off a cliff. Yeah, his career percentages yeah. were respectable until last year. Daryl Moore is not going to trade for that. And then Daryl Wright, who, I mean, he shot not terribly, but he's not known for his three-point shooting. Yeah. All Darryl- I know is that all I know is that only a jackass would have written an article about starting Justin Jackson before the year started. I am so alone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. That 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 was uh that was my miss. I missed that pretty badly. I also did not see the uh, uh the big emergence of Dorian hey, Smith. Do what? We no, no one did. I mean no one really did. I mean to be honest with you, the the, the day the, the years before Dorian Finney Smith this year, it was very he was very like a borderline NBA player. Yep. especially when he was first coming on. I mean, I meant he, he played three years in the summer league. Like, he wasn't fully developed. And he wasn't even that good in the summer league. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, uh, Dennis Smith was still better than him in the summer league. Then the second year, um, Dennis Smith – I mean, not even Dennis Smith, other guys. I mean, Jalen Brunson, he was getting – he was more effective in, in uh, you know, the summer league. And that was, like, his third year in the league. And you don't see a lot of third-year people playing in the summer league. So, right. uh, he definitely took a – a long time to to come along but he's he's proven to be one of the better contracts in the league like there's a lot that he brings oh yeah uh, he shoots the ball fairly well plays good defense. and he's also a very good offensive rebounder and it's something that we really need uh and so he's 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 basically at the, at the amount of money he's getting paid he's he's fairly well compensated and he's uh basically a good deal for for the mavericks and i think so I, if they would People were talking about trading him. I was like, ah, we should pump the brakes on that one. Yeah. Honestly. Yeah, like, we've got a great deal with him. We should, yeah, for sure. Good. And even yeah, with drafting a couple more players that, like I, I mentioned earlier, and uh, again, referenced the Bibbs tweet on uh, saying that basically they picked up like three more Dorian Finney-Smith types with higher ceilings than Dorian Finney-Smith. Like that doesn't mean that Dorian becomes expendable. It just means like, mm-hmm. hey, we don't have to ask him to do everything as far as the defense is concerned now like we actually have we should have like very capable perimeter defenders now and that's going to take burden off of Luca where now you know Luca's not going to have to guard like the most difficult matchup in the way of like point guards you'll be able to kind of hide Luca a little bit better and if whenever you get KP back since it won't be the start of the year you're going to then have a guy who anchors the whole thing so this is exactly the model Luca needs is just three and D basically guys around him, And there's reason to look at every one of the guys they got, whether by the trade or draft and say like, yeah, he could grow into a good three and D guy, or he's got the signs of being pretty ready made for that already. Like there's different aspects you look at and it makes sense what they're doing. I am curious to see how much they really are in go for it mode, so to speak. Like, in terms of free agency, I am actually not a fan of banking on next summer. Like, you know, the, the, whether it's the honest talk or whatever, like 
I, I don't care at this point about that. Like, I, uh, if something happens, sure, you evaluate then, but you don't plan on it and you don't like handicap your team and not make it as good as you can today in the hopes that maybe you can get your name, like your hat in that ring for consideration. Like, Well, uh, I think if the, if the passive crew and everything is players or free agents are not looking at cap space. They're looking right. at what, what players am I going to be playing around? Or like who are, the, who are the stars and who are the top players am I going to be playing around? And, you know, the Golden State Warriors didn't have the cap space to sign Kevin Durant. They signed him and they made moves to, to be able to acquire him. You know what I mean? Yep. That's how we got Harrison Barnes and Andrew Bogut that year. So we shouldn't have to be like, okay, don't, don't spend. I was hearing people saying, don't go all out this, uh, this free agency. Let's just keep our money for next year. And it's like, why? Why don't yeah. we just try to find decent guys that have good contracts will be e- easily be able to move if in case happen if that – Giannis does choose to come here, then we, we can make moves and be able to get uh, get out of contracts and create the space that we need. We don't have to have that space already available. Right. And that's that's all I'm saying. So yeah, we, we've and, that. people have done that before. It's not. It's not right. Not, and and if your team can, if you make your team as good as you can now, and they're able to make some kind of deeper playoff run, they're going to look more appealing even in that scenario with less cap money readily available than they would if you saved all the cap money in the world and had another seven or eight seed playoff appearance. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like don't, don't worry about it. Like go for it now. Try and put the best team out there. You can. Now I'm not saying like torpedo your, your future plans. Like you still have to be strategic in terms of how you manage mm-hmm. your cap and everything. Like you don't want to sign or make a couple big trades where you take on all this like huge bad money in a contract you want nothing to do with like a Horford type. I know that's obviously not happening, but bringing on a contract like that where you're like, Ooh, now we're the ones stuck with the bad contract. And now this screws up like these next couple extensions that we need to really be figuring out. You don't want to do that, but you do want to be in a, I think a more aggressive mode where you're like, you know, you don't really know how many chances you have. Like Mm -hmm. I know being the Oklahoma city guy from there, basically I cite that a lot. But consider the Thunder in the West Finals against the Mavericks 2011. Then the following year, they're in the finals. They have a 24-year-old Durant, a 23-year-old Westbrook and Harden, and they never went back. Now, like you don't know. Like, that was supposed to be the dynasty. The Warriors grew into what OKC was supposed to be. But, like, Mm -hmm. you don't know how many chances you really have. And so you have to be aggressive and go for it. And so I think what Dallas should do is, and there's so many names that they've been linked to, you know, like I said, they could still be in the the running for Gallinari or something for all we know at this point, given the other moves they've already pulled off, I don't necessarily hate it as much as I would if they had traded pick 18, but there's, there's moves Dallas can make that I think can still make them better in the immediate picture where now you could be looking at them and saying, that's a top four seed in the West. And based on that alone, anything is possible with them. Kevin yeah, Garnett I, somewhere losing his mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I definitely, I definitely agree with the sentiment. I mean, uh, this whole, like we've been saying, this whole, you know, plan powder and all that, a lot of stuff hasn't worked. And we've, we've done that for years. Uh, that's, that's one I don't say it's one of the reasons why I think a lot of free agents probably use the Mavericks as leverage and stuff like that. But uh, we've seen, uh, we just need to be a little bit more creative on how we use the cap uh, and stop being so, I guess, dry with this. Like, Oh, we have this much and then we can get this player. Let's go for this player. No, you just get better, get better, make yourself more appealing. The playoff one was awesome. No one was talking about Giannis coming to Dallas until they saw the, what we did against the Clippers. No one was talking about really about, I mean, the, the kind of world, but not really talking about the Mavericks unless it was talking about Luca. but yeah. no one was talking about the Mavericks making any type of, uh, any run at any championship uh, immediately. They were ever saying, hey, in the next like three years, it can be a But now everyone's like, you know, we, we can sleep, you know, don't sleep on the Mavericks here. They're, you know, they're, it can be good. It's kind of the same talk I was hearing with, about the Warriors before they made their move and stuff like that. Right. Uh, definitely don't, don't, I'm with you, dude. Don't hold on to cap space and stuff like that. Definitely have some sort of, some level of aggressiveness, but also a, a level of savviness too. 
don't throw away your whole future to try to win this year. There's really no need to. Um, but at the same time, don't hold back anything trying to get some big fish next year and stuff like that. Makes any sense. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, a couple notes real quick before we wrap up. Uh, w- with these draft picks coming in, obviously we have a lot of guards now. Um, mm-hmm. And so there's going to be guys that don't come back. I think this probably means that uh, we're not going to be bringing back Trey Burke as, as much as we said that dude deserved another deal here and how well he fits here. I would like mm-hmm. to have him back, but I don't, I think it's probably unlikely at this point. I never considered at this point there was any chance of Barea coming back, even though he says he wants to. I, I don't think you can stay married to, uh, to a contract or a player, so to speak. Apparently, apparently there's some publication in uh, Puerto Rico that said he's coming back, but nothing. Yeah. Else. I mean, yeah, he I, wants to come back, and Maverick, except from what I've heard, are more interested in, like, okay, you want to be back as an assistant? <laughs> like mm-hmm. that, that's what you can do for us. Like, yeah. you're talking about a guy that's going to be 36 – coming off an Achilles and we couldn't even play him like mm-hmm. at all last year. Like yeah. when he was there, he could show signs of effectiveness, but then when he played uh, bubble, anytime he appeared in that capacity, you were like, Ooh, he yeah. looks done. He definitely showed his former self. Yeah. So th- that's another change there. I don't think this impacts Brunson necessarily. I saw some people talking about how he could be dealt now if they make a trade it's possible, but I, I don't think that the, the drafting of Terry necessarily forces him out in that regard. So yeah. I don't know. I, I, I don't know uh, if they become like Ice Climbers 2.0, Devin and uh, Berea, but I could certainly see a scenario where they form a nice one-two punch um, in certain stretches there where they could both have a future here. I, I think Brunson is someone the Mavericks are still very high on. Mm-hmm. Yep, I, I I agree. Yeah, this is, this definitely doesn't mean Brunson's out. Um, even though, yes, he he he's probably still one of the best assets we have. But mm-hmm. yeah, just like just like you said, he's he's a good, he's still a good player. So why why get rid of good players? Uh, Ty, Tyrell, uh, he, I do see him in the Seth Curry type role. Yeah, he, he will play a lot of off ball. There's going to be screen set for him. He does he does move a lot. Uh, Herky jerkier than than Seth is, and that could you know get players off balance. And if he utilizes the screen, it could get him a lot more open looks. And and you know Brunson and Luca can definitely take advantage of that. I'm sure Rick Carlisle's drawing up some some steps that we can use to utilize the type of player that Tyrell Terry can be. So uh, I definitely yeah this doesn't this doesn't even affect Brunson's playing time. I don't, I don't think at least. Yeah, probably not. But I think that's going to wrap up for the time we have now, just giving initial thoughts and feedback on the, the Mavericks picks there. So just quick sum up again, 18, they get Josh Green, 31, they get Tyrell Terry. Uh, they trade Seth Curry then for pick 36, which becomes Tyler Bay and uh, for Josh Richardson, who while last year, not great, is still a very active three and D guy. Uh, can cause a lot of havoc defensively and in his time in Miami was a much better three point shooter than was, I think reflected last year with Philadelphia. So you're still talking about a guy that can contribute a hell of a lot and you got him on a very nice deal. You control him through, I think in 2021, 2022, he has a player option for like $11.6 million, but you mm-hmm. got him a little bit before then. So I think, you're good. You've, you've kind of shored up this nucleus. We talked about continuity being something mm-hmm. that we're focused on last year. They still maintain that even though they move on from Curry now. Yeah, we've got a hell of a lot younger too. My God, we, I think we only have, if Brad comes back, I think he will be the second player over the age of 30 on this team, which the only one is like Boban. This is yeah. The only so yep. We've got young. We, a, a nice change of pace of what we're used to down here in Dallas. <laughs> for sure. Yeah, and most title what, we've been uh, the retirement home for the most exactly. part. Yeah. Yep. If you're old and feeble and we'll put them in our starting lineup. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for yeah. sure. But, all right. Well, uh, if you guys like the video, don't forget to drop a like, uh, leave a comment below, 
subscribe to the Dallas Prospect and any, I'll let you hit the tagline. Are you ready? Oh, yeah. Every legend was once a prospect, like Tyra Terry. There you go. And Josh Green. There you go. Cool. Salute. Listen.